as a parent. There's nothing you can do when your child says that they can't breathe. A glass of water is not gonna, you know, open up their airway. You know, it's, it's nothing that they can cough up, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a terrible feeling. The smog is very bad in where we live in the summer. It's very bad. And, um, you know, you, you can feel it from just your everyday life. That's, to me, that's scary. It's a terrible, terrible thing to imagine that they're pulling in all that smog into their little bodies. I think for the first time, what parents are beginning to understand is that it isn't just somebody out there is being affected by air pollution, but that their child is being affected. Southern California, home to the nation's largest freeway system and to thousands of manufacturing and industrial facilities. Almost 13 million cars and trucks travel these roads every day. They emit enough pollutants to have earned Los Angeles the title of most polluted city in the country. We all know that air pollution is bad for us. We've seen the images before, people rubbing their eyes on days when the smog was really thick. But today, the effects of air pollution are not this obvious. So in the early 90s, scientists started to wonder if more subtle health damage might be happening to children who grow up breathing air pollution every day. Nobody really knew the answer. That's why the state agency charged with ensuring safe, clean air for all Californians stepped in. The California Air Resources Board was determined to find out if children are harmed by prolonged, repeated exposure to air pollution. So in 1991, the board began planning the largest ever long-term study on air pollution's health effects on California's children. It became known as the Children's Health Study. The Children's Health Study was set up about uh, 10 years ago to determine whether there are chronic effects of uh, air pollution in Southern California. Uh, it had been known for years that there are acute effects, that is, it'll make your eyes water, it'll make you cough, but the question is, does prolonged breathing of this kind of air result in permanent irreversible uh, damage to the lung? Dr. John Peters leads the team of scientists who conduct the study at the University of Southern California's Keck School of Medicine. The extensive study involves monitoring air quality, testing pollution samples, examining children's health, and then analyzing all the data collected. Dr. Jim Goderman heads up the statistical group that analyzes the data. They're trying to ultimately see whether kids who lived in high air pollution communities uh, had more respiratory symptoms or slower lung capacity growth. This is a question Tony Taylor worries about. She has four children and they all have asthma. When I'm having an asthma attack, it kind of feels like you're being suffocated. Tiffany and Tessany are twins. They were diagnosed with asthma at age five. Tamika was diagnosed at age two, and Max by the time he was just six months old. Their chest sits up, and they're just kind of like that. <laughs> but theirs is accompanied with a, a, a whistling, a wheezing. Nobody knows exactly what causes asthma, but scientists have been studying a host of contributing factors like genetics and diet, as well as environmental causes like indoor allergens and now air pollution. Tony and her kids live in Long Beach, five minutes away from the port, less than a block away from a busy freeway with a lot of trucks and surrounded on the north, south and west by refineries. How could it not be possible for them to ingest the things that are burning into the air, you know, and it not to affect them? Children are probably most uh, sensitive to air pollution because, uh, for one, their lungs are developing, uh, and so as those lungs develop, any assault to that developing tissue may have a, a large impact compared to an adult. Children typically are outside more exercising, breathing more rapidly than adults are, so in the same environment as an adult may actually be breathing in a lot more air pollution. And if you follow the pollution patterns, they typically uh, peak in the hours from, say, 3 to 6 in the afternoon. And that uh, correlates very well with when, when we see kids outside and, and being active. I and my children live here in Riverside. My oldest child is now 19. 
and then I have Charisma, who's 11, and um, my son, who's just turned nine, Ruben, and the baby. He's uh, 18 months old, Sergio. Irma Mesa's kids are all healthy, but she worries about the hidden effects air pollution may be having on them. I grew up in this area and um, live just down the street, and we have a view of the mountainsides here. Charisma and, and Ruben in the morning will be getting ready for school, and we'll look out our front living room, which shows the mountainside, just as when I was a teenager. If we cannot see the mountain that day, we know it's going to be a bad day. Our air pollution problem in Southern California is severe because of a combination of a lot of people in a relatively small place surrounded by mountains with weather conditions that are conducive to the formation of smog. Most of Southern California's air pollution comes from traffic, industry, and the ports. And diesel trucks are a major culprit. Huge amounts of these pollutants are generated in the central part of Los Angeles County. So residents who live there are the first ones exposed to them. So in the, in the LA area, we have a predominantly onshore flow of air, which means it comes off the Pacific Ocean and heads from west to east. So given that most of the automobile traffic occurs in the, the downtown LA area and the associated freeways that circulate around that area, those pollutants are then kind of lifted up off the ground and they start to head eastward. Uh, and so as they head eastward, these pollutants react with sunlight and form into particles, they form into acid, they form into nitrogen dioxide, they form into ozone uh, along the way. And so the most polluted places that we see are approximately 40 to 50 miles east of the L.A. area. And adding to that is the fact that we have mountain ranges that border us on the north, and they kind of curve around and border a little bit on the east as well. So it, it provides kind of a, a stew pot uh, for the air to sit. Robin Kotu lives right in the heart of this stew pot in an area called Pedley. Not only does she get L.A.'s pollution, but her community has plenty of its own pollution sources. I'm surrounded by four freeways within maybe a 20 mile radius, but I'm very close to one freeway and is a very busy freeway with a lot of trucks. There's a lot of truck stops and there's a lot of truck distribution centers. There's also two major train lines. The train actually goes right maybe about a half a mile from my house and that diesel is bad. So bad, the California Air Resources Board has declared the tiny particles in diesel exhaust toxic. Exposure to the particles is linked to both cancer and asthma. If it's a really smoggy day, you know, I'd prefer that my kids just stay in. Robin's daughter, Michelle, developed asthma at age 11. During the summer, sometimes they'll have practice during the, you know, the dead of the day. And I don't want her here because I, I don't want her to be sick. We have more and more uh, parents talking about their children developing asthma now or how their child had to drop out of his swimming team um, because of uh, he simply couldn't do it anymore. Um, how the coach at the high school talks about their track team and how the kids could barely make it around the, the field. And I guess that's why the USC study is so important. It shows that uh, you know we really have a problem here that needs to be addressed. The scientists chose to study 12 communities that are spread out within a 200-mile radius of downtown Los Angeles. The communities east of L.A. bear the brunt of the region's dirty air. These are the study's most polluted communities.